On the morning of February 24th, information was received about missile strikes on the territory of Ukraine, starting the Russian so-called special military operation. The ongoing events have already affected the lives of millions of people in Russia, Ukraine, and the Western countries, and an enormous amount of propaganda is being spilled. One of the sides is calling to donate for the Ukrainian army, whilst others call for weakening NATO and the US by any means. However, both are wrong. While the role of Western imperialism is well known, the real motivation of the Russian government is covered by different slogans. In this video, we would like to go through the main chauvinist arguments and show what position the communist movement should take in case of these events. The current rhetoric of Vladimir Putin and other representatives of the bourgeois Russian Federation is based on the presentation of the current regime in Ukraine as a fascist one. According to the president of Russia, neo-Nazis seize power in the country. One of the goals of the military operation is officially declared as the denazification of Ukraine. A similar position is supported by some leftists in Russia and other countries, claiming that this is going to weaken the US and NATO. All arguments usually come down to these positions. Firstly, the existence of ultra-right organizations and military formations in Ukraine. Secondly, an indication of their activities expressed in participation in the war in the Donbass, the growth of chauvinist sentiments in the country, and the actions of political terror. This is presented as irrefutable evidence of the Nazi nature of the Ukrainian government. Let's take a look at what fascism and Nazism are. Fascism is a specific political regime in a bourgeois state which is characterized by these things. The suppression of democratic rights and freedoms up to their complete absence, elimination of democratic authorities, the concentration of the fullness of state power in the hands of the sole head of state, conducting police terror, establishing censorship, large scale repression and suppression of dissenters, the destruction of the communists and the suppression of the working class, chauvinism, xenophobia, nationalism, in some cases, extreme racism, ethnic cleansing. Such a regime is established by the capitalists during a period of socio-political upheaval to save capitalist society from collapse and social revolution, to punish the working class and the communists. It may seem that as a result of the events of 2013 to 2014 in Ukraine, there was a transition to fascism. However, the situation is not as obvious as it looks. Even before the Euromaidan, Ukrainian capitalists reigned supreme in all spheres of public life. The labor and communist movements by that time and up until nowadays were not any serious threat to the ruling regime. The key moment of the bourgeois coup of 2014 was the question, which imperialist camp should bourgeois Ukraine orient itself towards? This issue was resolved by a change in the ruling group of capitalists and the establishment of a more reactionary form of liberal democracy. Modern Ukraine is characterized by an increase in political reaction and a tendency towards fascization. This is a process of gradual curtailment of bourgeois democracy and transition to an open dictatorship. Before the current events in Ukraine, bourgeois democratic freedoms were largely preserved. Now the ruling elites try to cover up its pressure on the workers with references to military hardships and Russian activity. Hence the work of political parties of various shades, an elected parliament and a president who does not have absolute power in his hands and is not an autocratic dictator, which distinguishes fascist states. The current Ukrainian government is indeed characterized by nationalism, ardent anti-communism, and the use of ultra-right elements. It is a well-known fact that there are nationalist sentiments in Ukraine and, indeed, openly neo-Nazi groups, the most infamous of which are Pravi Sektor and Azov Battalion. However, they do not make up the majority of the population of Ukraine, nor do they constitute the majority of the armed forces of Ukraine. This can be proved by the fact that the parties they created have never become any significant forces. This, however, may change now, as the actions of the Russian capitalist state are used for justification of the fascization. All nationalists, fascists, and neo-Nazis in Ukraine claim they were right all along and increase their influence. The chauvinist hysteria rages on in both Russia and Ukraine, countries that live decades in peace and friendship under socialism. The question may arise, if there is a reactionary regime in Ukraine, are the Russian capitalists the lesser evil? 
The irresponsible leftists and communists following bourgeois propaganda usually point to the law and decommunization adopted by the Ukrainian government. These people forget that for decommunization, it is not at all necessary to pass laws. The interests of the entire bourgeois society and each individual capitalist, regardless of whether he is Russian or Ukrainian, dictate the need to distort, slander, and hush up everything connected with communism. Didn't these same capitalists make every effort to destroy the USSR first, and then its legacy? Are they not hushing up the role of the communists in the Great Patriotic War? The attitude of the Russian government towards the Bolsheviks as betrayers of the national interests is well known. The country regularly perpetuated the memory of the White Guards and nationalists, enemies of the communists. Even the current military operation was declared the result of the Bolsheviks' policies and is carried out under the slogan of decommunization of Ukraine. One should take a closer look at things such as Rusich and Radabor battalions in the D-LPR and the Russian private military corporation, Wagner Group. The process of fascization is characteristic of all capitalist countries plunging into crisis, including the biggest former Soviet Republic, where the bourgeoisie is actively attacking the rights and freedoms of workers. Many of the processes mentioned above in relation to Ukraine are also taking place here. External attributes of a certain form of fascism are not necessary at all for its other forms. Fascism is engendered by a specific economic and political situation, which is not going to be eliminated by orientation towards other capitalists. It's important to note that in the mind of an ordinary human living in the countries of the former USSR, the term Nazism is associated with absolute evil with inhuman cruelty. In the current environment, this allows the ruling classes to instantly demonize the enemy and evoke appropriate associations that lead to support for their nation's actions. As a result, the fair, anti-fascist nature of the military operation is presented as a matter of course. The Russian bourgeoisie wants to solve its problems and protect its interests in the region. The operation of the Russian troops is supposed to muffle the indignation of the masses at the falling standard of living and restore shattered confidence in the government. From the first hours, the media and government officials have been saying that the current operation is a forced step, that Russia was forced to take it as a last resort to protect the self-proclaimed republics. In his speech, in which Putin announced the conduct of a special military operation, he emphasizes that all responsibility for possible bloodshed will be entirely on the conscience of the Ukrainian regime. Allegedly, when all the means available for this have exhausted themselves, Russia was forced to resort to at least prevent bloodshed and to enforce peace. Why is this not the case? Firstly, Russia was actively shaping pro-Russian movements in Ukraine long before the events of 2013 to 2014. Penetrating through the media, ideologists and politicians, financial support for various movements, Russia formed and supported the pro-Russian part of the Ukrainian bourgeoisie. And it was precisely the critical mass nurtured against this background that bore fruit in 2013 to 2014, creating political movements, putting forward slogans of a union with Russia, and so on. Secondly, with the help of its military specialists, the Kremlin managed to take control of the protest sentiments of the cities of the eastern part of Ukraine, and specifically the Donbas, and create formally independent republics in Donetsk and Luhansk. Thus, the Russian bourgeoisie was able to recoup the loss of the pro-Russian regime throughout Ukraine in order to protect the interests of their energy corporations and maintain influence. The presence of a certain territory not controlled by Kiev was a lever of pressure on the Ukrainian and Western bourgeoisie. In the future, Russia provided all-round support to the D-LPR. So, Russia's role here is by no means limited to passive observation. Moreover, the issue of recognizing the independence of these republics was artificially inflated since Russia carried out economic, cultural, and military interaction with them even without formal diplomatic recognition. So it is safe to say that the presence of a long-term conflict near the borders of the Russian Federation was beneficial to the bourgeoisie. The Minsk agreements, around which there were so many conversations, in reality had almost no effect on the bloodshed in the Donbass and, in essence, could not. Thirdly, the current support for the D-LPR is just an excuse for an operation. If the goals were only the protection of the D-LPR, 
then they would be recognized within the current borders and border security would be established. The ultimate goal of the military operation is to put pressure on the Western imperialists and establish control over Ukraine to strengthen influence in the region in order to obtain new markets and capital. During the beginning of 2022, negotiations had been held between the Russian Federation and the United States on security guarantees in Europe, which among other things, included a discussion of the issue of Ukraine not joining NATO. It was this threat that the Russian authorities presented as one of the main reasons for the outbreak of hostilities. Of course, it is impossible to deny the growing tensions between the Russian Federation and NATO. The facts speak for themselves. The active expansion of the bloc to the east, the deployment of weapons and missiles, anti-Russian rhetoric, the systematic deprivation of the Russian Federation of its allies and dependent states, as well as negotiation on Ukraine's entry into NATO. However, with all of this, several important provisions are forgotten. There were few prerequisites for Ukraine to be accepted into NATO in the near future. It did not meet all the formal requirements, and most importantly, the allegiance itself did not have a pronounced desire to accept Ukraine at all costs. Judging by the events of recent months, it is much more accurate to assume uncertainty about the position of the United States and its allies, and the desire to negotiate with the Russian capital. Otherwise, no negotiations on security guarantees would have taken place. Even today, the US doesn't want to see Ukraine in NATO, claiming that this fact can start World War III. In the events preceding the operation, we will not find any reason for the real concern of the Russian bourgeoisie. Quite the contrary. Large-scale military exercises, the pulling of large military groups to the borders, and, finally, the sudden evacuation of the population from the DPR and LPR. All these things were carried out by the Russian authorities. This, however, does not mean that those events are beneficial exclusively to the Russian bourgeoisie. Secondly, the non-bloc status of Ukraine itself does not mean that Ukraine will cease to be an ally and dependent state of Western imperialism. If we go all the way, then the Kremlin is worried not only about the possible accession of Ukraine to NATO, but also the very fact that Ukraine belongs to Western capital. This is exactly what Putin would like to fix, and the pro-Russian character of Ukraine is expressed not only in friendly relations with the military political sphere, but in the corresponding relations in the economic sphere thanks to which Ukraine will be controlled by Russian oligarchs to increase profits and strengthen their positions. Thirdly, the equal positions in the struggle between Russia and the West are doubtful. On both sides are capitalists and high-ranking officials, corporations and top managers who profit equally from the common people and compete with each other for spheres of influence, for markets, labor, and capital. Those people who call for donations to the Ukrainian army and blame the Russian people should be asked to do the same thing for the peoples of Ukraine, of the European Union, and of the United States, as their governments made contributions as well. The desire for expansion, an objective for all capitalist countries, is not alien to the Russian bourgeoisie, which is also making attempts to expand. Forming military political alliances and blocs, building economic unions, establishing control, over other countries. Russian corporations are developing new territories, absorbing foreign enterprises, and exploiting workers in other countries while running into the resistance of foreign capitalists engaged in the same. And in this case, it is not a question of securing the country, but of getting better conditions for the national bourgeoisie in comparison with foreign partners. It is this private interest of the largest Russian corporations that they're trying to pass off as some kind of nationwide interest. When bourgeois propagandists assure the working people that Russia is forced to defend its national interests, this is only half the truth. The whole truth is that the Russian government is defending the interests, first of all, of the imperialist bourgeoisie, which owns power in the country. All of this should strengthen the position of energy, financial, and armed corporations of the Russian Federation, and none of these reasons has anything to do with the interests of the workers. All profits and benefits will eventually go to the bourgeoisie, and its hardships and misfortunes will fall on the shoulders of the working people. All questions that are raised relate to the interests of narrow groups of the international bourgeoisie, and in no way concern the interests of the working people. Just as their own countries do not belong to them, and they do not dispose of all the wealth produced, so the international policy of their governments 
is not at all in their interests. The capitalists have already profited from it, but the broad masses of the people of both countries have lost. This is a disgusting product of capitalism and will bring nothing but misfortune and impoverishment to the peoples of Ukraine and Russia. A month after the beginning of this operation has made a great influence. Russian retail chains inflated prices. Oil and gas prices are growing in Europe. The ruble exchange rate dropped down, destroying mostly the savings of average Russian people. A lot of Western companies stopped working in Russia or with the Russian citizens. The sanctions imposed against Russia will be a heavy burden on the people and not on the capitalists, who continue to increase their fortunes even up until nowadays. The reactionary hysteria increased many times over on both sides. It was imposed by the ruling class. The rapid development of events should not plunge the communists into a panic. It is necessary not to succumb to bourgeois propaganda, but calmly and methodically explain to the working people the essence of what's happening. The only true position that can be taken in this conflict is the position of proletarian internationalism. Implacable struggle against all manifestations of social chauvinism. The struggle against capitalism for the liberation of the working people and the establishment of socialism throughout the world. The effective activities of workers and communists are possible only if there is a real communist organization, which, unfortunately, was not created in peacetime in both countries. However, the contradictions of capitalism, which are aggravated during such a period, inevitably lead to an understanding by the masses of the gravity of their position. At this moment, we wish all conscious communists to intensify their work and unite as soon as possible on the basis of Marxist-Leninist theory. We wish the working people not to panic, not to be provoked, to observe precautions, and remember that the main reason for such terrible events is capitalism. Stay tuned.